What is up, guys? This is Stu, and it's another episode of the What the Fuck Gym Talk podcast. I have my friend Annie fucking Miller. Um, that's not really her middle name. I just <laughs> fucking know. Uh, I met Annie through our mutual friend, Sean Pastuch. Like what? Like two years, 2020? When did he start the little, the little breakfast, like this little club thing that he does? That I want to say 2020, late 2020. Yeah, yeah. I think it was 20. It, that sounds like a 2020 uh, project, right? Yes. Like yeah. we're all, we're all not that busy. We're not as busy now. So let's, uh, let's get together. No, Sean, yeah. he's a connector. If anything else, uh, yes. Sean Pastooch over at the active life, put together a group of people, uh, entrepreneurs. And that was the, you know, I'd heard of you, but it was the first time I got to kind of see you face to face via zoom. Um, I have not been, uh, as good with the attendance on there cause Friday's now become my travel day typically. Um, oh. so, but, um, I was, you know what, any, I, I'm not gonna lie. Whenever I would see like a hashtag fits, is it fits pro fits pro it's pro. Yes. Yeah. I was like, uh, that's a dog shit, sleazy bullshit. I'm going to teach you how to do an online fitness business. Like, I was just like, I, I saw the bad version of that come out like a la, and I, I like Alex Ramosi, but like a la Alex Ramosi, the online digital coaching guy, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I, I saw that. And then uh, you were like probably one of the first examples that I thought was like, it's, I don't feel that. Do you, do you feel, do you, I mean, you obviously have to keep somewhat of a bird's eye view on your industry. That is the online oh, yeah. coach scenario. Is, is it as full of bullshit as I think it is? Or am I just like, am I just giving a blanket uh, characterization to it? You know, sometimes I wonder if I've just created a bubble for myself that is less full of bullshit. So I'm like, we're making progress. <laughs> this is so good because I have chosen colleagues to follow and people to follow that are in my perspective, a lot more education-based, no bullshit-based, selling the long-haul mentality, not selling quick fixes. I'm amidst a lot of that now, so I feel like we've made a lot of progress, but I literally created the word Fitzpro, like in a satirical sense, because Fitzpo is yeah. like girls selling fitness programs based on nothing other than their genetics on the internet. Yeah, that's probably the head, that's probably what I was referring to was, was yes. that version. Yeah. So Fitzbo is literally like, how do I enter this space and basically play on that word, but take it a completely different direction, which is where Fitz Pro, which is why Pro is like bold in the word underlined. Like we're not here to be Fitzbo's. We're here to do fitness in the way that I I have coined as right. So it yeah, you're uh, it's like what I call UBF, like your unique belief in fitness. Yes. Yeah. I mean, none of us can't, none of us are coming up with new exercises. Right. We're right. just got recipes and we have a, we have a brand, we have a style of personality and a flavor that people like. Yep. Um, when did you, when did you start? Go, when did you go uh, like all in on your online business? So in 2018, um, I started the business in 2015, which was in person and online training at that time. It was called Fit Design by Annie. Uh, re in person and, where did you have brick and mortar your garage um so little brick and mortar but it was a competitive cheerleading gym that I coached at and there was a training area and I was able to train there for an 80 percent cut so that's like way better than you're going to get yep. in most gyms yep. um, and I didn't want to work for a globo gym I went to school for uh, strength and conditioning so got my CSCS was going to be a strength and conditioning coach in college um, or at the collegiate level found out that that was not what I wanted to do. So started the business in 2015, working for myself, knew that I wanted to eventually go all online. And then in 2017, my husband was like, what if we just traveled the world? And I was like, don't fucking tempt me, sir. <laughs> don't tempt me. Yeah. So I said, you know, I need to make a little bit more money in my online business, but we could totally do it. And then nine months later we took off and that was in 2018 and we traveled for a year and that was my like sink or swim. We're going to make this. Yeah. Blow up. Where, yeah. uh, where'd you go to school? Uh, Concordia University in Portland. Okay. Exercise and sports science. Got it. And where are you, where yeah. are you at now? Uh, Vancouver, Washington. So Got just okay. north of that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Oh, fuck. When I was yeah. out visiting the street parking crew, if I would have known, I could have, I should have hit you up because they're Vancouver, Washington. I didn't know that. Like the... <laughs> Actual whatever CEO. Yeah. Oh no, yeah, street like street parking, like Miranda Aldroy, yeah. uh, well Miranda uh, Alvarez and Julian and the whole thing. Yeah, I did not realize they were based here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, very so, cool. um, 
it's funny. I same thing with like college. All I thought, all I wanted to do was be a collegiate strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. And I got one got accepted into a master's program for exercise phys. I did my undergrad and, and I, I went and it was in middle uh, MTSU, middle Tennessee state university. And I, I went and literally uh, was it the GRE, the graduate te- exam you got to take. Yeah. yeah. They were literally like, bro, we're not going to lie. Like not, not going to sugarcoat it. Not a lot of people come here for our exercise science program. Okay. <laughs> Here's the deal. Show up, take the exam. I don't care what you get on it. You will get in here and we'll be able to throw some, some money at it. For like from a scholarship perspective, I was like, Oh my gosh, it was, it was like, I had, it was the most unreal thing. I'm having this conversation there. And I remember calling my mom, like, I'm, I'm going to get accepted in the grad school. I'm going to get yeah. my master's in this. And she's like, <laughs> Did, did you study? Are you, what, do you, what do you mean? Are you study real hard? Like, actually, I don't think I have to study all that much at all. Like, I <laughs> think it's going to be okay. So, but I, I put my deposit down in my dorm and I, uh, I never showed. I quit. I, I figured like, I was like, fuck it. I'm not going, I'm not doing this. And that's when I just went a yeah. little entrepreneur route. And, uh, you know, you think I, that if you went to school, you went to school for exercise phys or exercise science, just related. Yeah. Yeah. If you went there, like, what the fuck are any of us doing? Like, what were we thinking? <laughs> like, what's the, you have, you get the lab, you can go into the lab, you could be like right. Peter Atia or, yeah. you know, that you kind of go thing. go the research route, yeah. Yeah, or you go strength and conditioning where you're going to be, you know, a, you know, a GA's assistant. You're going to be like just bitch work for a while. And the second the head coach gets fired, you're gone, right? Like, I, bitch you know, work is all I did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I loved it. I loved I loved everything about the collegiate strength world besides 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. Like, wasn't a big fan of that. (laughs) Sure. Uh, So, yeah. Did you like, I didn't like working with good athletes, like collegiate good athletes, because the job is, I mean, like, I remember being very explicit, like, your only job is to not get them injured. Like, I actually don't care if they physically get better. These are the best. Like, these kids are genetic specimens. Don't get them injured. So now, and I remember when I was in school, so it was like 2008, that story, maybe it was 09. Uh, it was the University of Arizona, I think it was, or ASU. And uh, a kid broke his collarbone starting like tight end or whatever, broke his collarbone, uh, bench pressing in the way. I mean, that strength coach is gone and he's blacklisted. He's fucked. Yeah. Like that yeah. scared me. I was just like, and the the best athletes didn't want to work that hard because they knew where that. And I like, I was like, oh, I thought I was going to get to make these kids better. They're like, not really. Just don't fucking get them hurt. Like keep yeah, them yeah. here. But yeah, it was very, uh, I was disenchanted with it really fucking quick. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, I wasn't a fan of the politics for sure. Um, and you did not certainly have the freedom to do what you thought was best with the athletes. So I can see that. It's also, it's a, it's a fucking patriarchy too. Like you being a female in that you're in the, you're in the minority. You're like, you're like our girl, Rachel, right? Like, I mean, like, I fucking hate that narrative, like with every inch of my soul. Uh, I'm not saying you like, you know, hold that. Think, are you whatever. saying it's? Are you saying women have way more? Like, are there more women involved in strength and conditioning than what I'm thinking? Because no, I, there's not. There's yeah. not. I just don't see it as a barrier. So God. Oh no, no. Uh, I guess yeah, that's yeah. like yeah. My I remember. Um, I have a funny story about this. So I I didn't know. I mean, I suppose I didn't. I knew it was male dominated, but like that never. I just knew I wanted to be a strength coach and like my knowledge stopped there, I guess. I was like, so I'm going to be a strength coach. Uh, And I was interviewing at another internship that I had done at a physical therapy clinic as a performance coach for like gap, uh, bridging the gap between you're done with physical therapy, but you're not returned to sport ready. So they had performance coaches for that section of rehab. So I was interning there and they actually offered me the job of my supervisor at the time, which I thought was unethical. So I did not take that job. Um, But he was like, so how are you coping with being in a male dominated field? And I was like, what do you, what are you talking about? (laughs) I'm doing good, I guess. I mean, (laughs) I enjoy it. I have not had any like bad experiences. So there's also a bias that like, I had a great experience. So I don't have any, uh, whatever it may be like, inappropriate things that happened or anybody, you know, disregarding me because I was a female that didn't happen in the space that I was in. So both players and colleagues and other coaches, a uh, player one time. That's why uh, I think I don't, I really don't picture it from coach to coach as yeah. much. Maybe if the coach is in there, like 
they're older. They're from a generation right, right, ago, right. maybe. Yeah. It was mainly um because there was a couple girls. They were they you know the women at, at least where I was at in my experience. It seemed like all the girls were um athletic trainers, tape you right. up afterwards kind of thing. And the guys Got were all it. doing this training conditioning. There was one girl I remember. She was an AT, and then she wanted to like transition. And I remember having a conversation with her. I don't know, it was maybe my sophomore, junior year. And she's just like, I see the way that some of the, the athletes, you know, they get, you know, they can get mouthy with even the male strength. They get a like they, they, you know, mm -hmm. they butt heads. Like, I don't know how that would, that would work for me. I, I'm like, I think it'd be okay. But at the same time, I can see, I can see why if you didn't really have a strong, you know, if you didn't really believe in your skill set, yeah. it would be difficult maybe to, you know, to go toe to toe and let the the six foot seven guy know, like, yo, bro, fucking like do this at this percentage. Don't don't show off. We're not doing that. Like or whatever you need yeah. to crack down on. Yeah, I was not. Uh, that is not a fear of mine. <laughs> so it bode well for me, I guess, uh, being in that space, which I also recognize like my personality, uh, if you want to whatever Enneagram eight challenger, like uh, don't know my own size in a fight type of of yeah, personality yeah, yeah. so yeah. I think that that um obviously needed to be matured at that time I was like whatever 22 but uh I think that it worked in my favor for the most part the one thing I think I've always really respected um since we first met and I started following your content is there's obviously you're, you're very thoughtful with what you do from uh it's always what I call like um there's there's looks and personality okay <laughs> um and, you know, you go up to a guy or girl at the bar and if they're a nine, but they have dog shit personality, they can't carry conversation. They don't have a sure. sense of humor. They're not engaging. That's only going to last so long. But you, you right. know, you could. There's plenty of, uh, you know, sub uh, sub attractive individuals that have amazing personalities right. and are, you know, whatever. You're so your stuff is so carefully curated from an aesthetic perspective, but then there's just so much personality and punch and context behind it. When you're preparing content, and I, I'm hoping any of the gym owners and any of the the online fitness uh, entrepreneurs that listen to this, I think it's kind of like a constant battle. Do do I focus more on the aesthetic of it? Do I focus more on the context of it? Where is your advice on that? Um. I mean, both, I think that a lot of, it depends on if you're building a personal brand as well. I'm building a personal brand. So it's easier for me, or maybe comes more naturally to me to insert my personality into my content because I'm creating it. Now, if you don't have a personal brand, there does still need to be a vibe, a feel that is evoked when people consume your content. Obviously your brand is very brash in your face. No bullshit. Right. Yep. I follow other people. Um, Alyssa Chang, she does um, fitness from a neurological perspective. Her brand's feel is very calm and welcoming and inviting. And so I think that that's extremely important, that that's cohesive in your, in your brand, that that's clear, uh, because we want to attract the right people, but that should also like deter someone who is not a great fit for whatever it is that you're putting out there. So sure. I'm pretty aggressively thoughtful in that myself. I um I give people a piece of advice that I, it was essentially just what what worked for me and what I do truly believe I think it works best for people getting started in the online space, whether they're creating a personal brand or they're kickstarting some kind of an online business. Mm -hmm. Um, speed over the quality in the beginning, like there's two scary buttons. Oh, frequency. And, yeah, it, yeah. The, the scariest buttons are record. Like mm -hmm. get, getting comfortable with that and then upload. Those are the two scary buns. And the more you can just get reps in, like, yep. and I tell people like, who's your favorite person online? And they're like, blah, Annie Miller. I'm like, cool, scroll. I, I fucking yeah. tell your thumbs bleed. Go to post yes. one through 10. I bet you it looks like dog shit compared to now. Guarantee it. It's literally right? scrambled eggs. It's an omelet with an Instagram filter over the top of it. And it is disgusting. <laughs> I can tell you what it is. <laughs> so did you, would you recommend the same thing and be like, listen, mm -hmm. just get your fucking reps in. I am huge, huge, huge on frequency early on. Get as much out as you can. One, you're going to find your voice. You're going to find your messaging. You're going to get feedback. Every piece of content you put out is feedback on how it's doing. Like as objectively as you can view it, as early as you can do that, the more success you're going to have in business for yeah. sure. Especially, I mean, especially on it. If we're talking Instagram, that's like frequency is the name of the game when you're starting. Sure. For so many reasons. 
where uh, I I started WTF in 2015, um, mm-hmm. slightly out of boredom and a little bit out of like I just I, I have a huge amount of uh, ego around uh, the 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 gym business thing, and I just if if I'm in a conversation, a bunch of people are spitting talking out of their ass, and I know in my heart of hearts, I'm like, you are not right. Like what you're yeah. saying is fundamentally fucked. I just I can't shut up. I have to say something. <laughs> I'm just that guy. Um, yeah. That's why me and Sean get along so well. I'm not surprised, yeah. Yeah, and um, I you know the first you know all the videos were iPhone videos. I had no concept of brevity. Mm-hmm. Every video was 19 minutes long of me monologuing, mm-hmm. um, and on different topics or news bites or this that and the other thing. And I had the benefit of back then, like Facebook groups, like I oh, really yeah. search CrossFit in Facebook groups. I was a member of South African CrossFit groups, Christian fit CrossFit group, like every cross. And those were just little distribution channels in 2015. I make one yeah. video and, you know, it was just doom, drop them in there and let people talk about it. that's you can't do that much anymore because um, it gets too spammy type scenario. How did you yeah. first again with an audience of zero? first get going uh instagram and it was yeah. literally what you said i would post like three to five times a day um obviously back then it was chronological order but yep. i it's funny because i'm like that's still what i would tell someone to do yeah like, that's still the the tactic that i would use it's not um maybe the same as far as chronological but the benefits of doing it are the same so that was what i did three to five times a day um Honed in on my messaging, honed in on who I was talking to. I say it took two and a half years for me to actually uh, decide who my ideal client is, if you want to say, or what my niche was going to be, what I was actually going to talk about. For the first two and a half years, I was really just throwing spaghetti at the wall and finding what the heck I was going to say and what I was going to sell and all of that. Because remember, I was training in person as well. So I wasn't dependent on the online side for income until... Until yeah, until you guys decided to go travel the world. Yeah, but yep. my content largely grew because of uh, something that I wasn't, I was intentionally doing it. I didn't think I would become known for it, I guess, which was uh, working out in like normal clothing, not sure. uh, half naked, you know, the butthole yeah. cam status. Um, I had a saying that was like, not fitness through the eye of the butthole. Um, which was my, that was intentional because sure. I knew I wasn't uh, naive to the fact that I am attractive or have decent genetics when it comes to my body. And I didn't want people to think that that's what I was selling. So I had to kind of go hard in the education direction and being mindful of how I presented my body, my physique, my messaging online to make it clear that that is not what I was selling. Were you so, rocking that like big t-shirt Billy Eilish style, like before Billy, like just like, oh, yeah. like to be over, yeah. you know, to just conceal more? Yeah, I mean, I, um, if it was like, a, I did find when I created Movement 101, that was kind of my first realization of like, oh, I need to wear clothing that does allow people to see the movement, right? Like that is important if I'm literally educating people on form and movement. Um, so I, I toned it back, but yeah, I was wearing like, my husband is, you know, six foot two fifty, and I was wearing his t-shirts to the gym for my workout yeah. videos. Cause that's just what I wore to the gym. Um, but I did start to get more, you know, uh, still wearing something that may be smaller or shows my body more, but mindful with the angles, like front 45 is, is the angle for most movements that allow you to see what you need to see for most things. So I became very well known for that uh, in having a successful business as well, which is kind of what led to me starting to coach business because people were like, wait, you've built this business without butt selfies. How, how did you do it? How did you do it? (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) that's how I got into the uh, business side of things. And that's, you know, it's, um, did you take any, do you ever have any experience in public speaking that when like when you're getting the strength and conditioning, you have to command a group, right? Like, so there's that, you sure. have that experience, but I find a lot of people have a hard time with a monologue. They have a hard, like when mm-hmm. I watch your delivery, I, I study a lot of um, stand up comedy and uh, people who give Love speeches stand-up. professionally. And I just, mm-hmm. timing, 
the ability to hold a moment for a little bit, even though it's like it's Instagram, it's not like you have an immediate audience reaction, but you know, like I watch you the way you're the voice inflection, you go, so you go, you go up and then you let it sit for a second, like let the audience, like if they were in front of you, you kind of know the reaction yeah, you're yeah, having. Yeah. You do that very well, whether, I don't know if it's, on, my guess is it's on purpose and, and you are a master of that craft. How did, how does that happen? Cause I have people that I get them again, hit record, they hit upload. And it's the delivery is you could tell there's not a lot of public speaking experience either um, informally or formally at all. It's just kind of like, and la, 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 la. it's just like, it's talking at yeah, yeah, the yeah, camera yeah. instead of talking yeah, yeah, with yeah. them. For sure. Um, I also watch a grip of stand up comedy. Almost every podcast I listen to or watch on YouTube is stand up comics. Tim Dillon, favorite? Andrew Schultz, like uh, probably Tim Dillon's monologues. Oh my God. Fuck. <laughs> Dude, fuck! I'm so I'm so happy that guy came out during COVID, like or like oh. showed up on COVID during COVID. I didn't know him before that. He's yeah. incredible, incredible. Yeah, I'm careful of who um, most comics that I like, which I mean, comedy isn't PC most of the time. Sure, but I definitely like like too soon comedy, not PC comedy. So I don't share often publicly uh, who I choose to listen to or uh, take in comedy from, which I'm like- What Annie's comedy. saying when she says too soon comedy, she likes a good 9-11 <laughs> joke every now and then is what she's saying, right? I mean, who doesn't? Right. Who yes, doesn't? Yes, yes. I'm um, waiting for I who's have... going to drop the Nashville joke. Who's going to do a Nashville kids like joke soon? Someone's going it's... to. I just, I don't know if I cope with humor and it's like an unhealthy thing, but that's, I don't know. I like it. So anyway, watching that, um, and I am big on, I tell all of my business clients and fitness coaches to always create from a consumer standpoint, like always be observing yourself as a consumer. Why are you watching that video? Why is it engaging to you? Why did you actually click that link? Why did you actually want to purchase? What did that email say that made you feel X? Like, it's all around us. Marketing is all around us. Media is all around us now. And so I just feel like I'm decent at, um, and maybe it's my background in like competitive cheerleading and choreography. I don't know. That allows me to observe something, understand why it's working, and then just parrot it, replicate that myself with, you know, my own content. It's yeah. something that I find has come naturally, but I would say that that it doesn't come naturally uh, in the absence of me observing other media and other content. Yeah, I um, I, I always think with social media, I there's like three categories of kind of people I follow. They're colleagues, clients. So anyone, I'm, any gyms I'm working mm -hmm. with, I follow mm -hmm. them. And then it's it's people who in, who I think inspire me creatively from the style. So if I if I watch three Chris Rock stand ups over a weekend. I will start talking like Chris Rock same, same. And, and, and pick it up immediately. Like it, it, I just, I just start parroting that. Cause that's how I yeah. learned how to do everything. I learned every coach can cue. I, I, I remember watching Mark Ripito videos until, yes. and, 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 and Louis C or uh, Louis Simmons. And yeah. I would literally like, I started like, I I'd start talking like I was from Wichita, Kansas, like Mark Ripito. And I'm like, I'm fucking yeah. from Cleveland. Ohio. This is ridiculous. But that's how I, I parrot. I mimic. Yep. And then I make it my own eventually. Exactly. I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a gene. I don't know if you teach that to people, but I would say that that is absolutely how I function. What do you, so. you transition to business. What, what's your portfolio look like? What percentage is directly fitness versus business right now? 60 business, 40 fitness. So it was very important to me to keep fitness when I transitioned to business because I only transitioned to business. One, there was a demand that I saw. Sean actually asked me on his podcast in 2017, like, when are you going to start coaching business? And I was like, never. I hate business coaches. They're scumbags and the worst. Uh, because that was my experience as far as Facebook ads in my face. Yeah. Make make six figures in 90 days, mm -hmm. whatever. Drive this Maserati. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. I would go to these people's pages. And I'm like, where is the successful fitness business that you built? Oh, you haven't? Cool. I don't mm -hmm. give a fuck what you have to say. Sure. So um, that was my perspective. And so I figured, I obviously went back on my word and was like, well, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it my way. And hopefully that helps people. And it's going to be counter to what they've consumed from everybody else that I had encountered anyway. Uh, from a per client or average client revenue standpoint, is there a Delta big difference between 
your fitness and the business clients? Because I've yeah. got client, I've got friends that do very similar things. And I asked that same question about the portfolio breakdown. And I'm like, do you ever then start like at some point be like, fuck, the business clients pay more than the fitness or whatever it is. And then you start like slowly, you know, letting the portfolio shift to the more lucrative clientele. Um, so I'm sure that a business coach may tell me to do that. Uh, just from a principal standpoint, I am probably always going to keep the fitness side of things. Uh, also from like a captive customer standpoint, I have very, very high. I do not have the percentage. My assistant could calculate that between my fitness and my business side, huge client carryover. So most of the people inside Built by Annie, inside my training membership are actually coaches. They see that and then they're like, fuck, I want to do pure programming because they know that they've experienced the way that I program. And they're like, I want to do this for my clients with the confidence that she has in program design. And so then they join either Fitzpro for how to build their business in the fitness space or pure programming for how to write programming for a year plus long-term periodization. So there's, it's beneficial to have both because there's so much carryover in clientele. So your fitness um, service kind of acts like a farm league then potentially for accidentally. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I, it makes yeah. sense. It makes, I mean, it's yeah. like, it's like every gym who has uh, coaches who are originally clients, right? Yes. It's just like yeah. people get into something they have a transformation. They enjoy it. They generally hate their nine to five, it, 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 you know, yeah. and they see, well, she's successful and she teaches, oh, she taught me how to squat, deadlift and press. So, you know, mm -hmm. she teach me how to do this. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, uh, on the business coaching side, how is yours run? I like, well, let's actually go back to this. You, is there also a side of you that keeps the fitness because is there any, cause I remember I came out to all you, I think you were on that call and that was when we had gotten the offer to lease on my building and I was having yeah, yeah. to make that decision. I was, I was like, I can't, I'm fucking, I, I can't like all my credibility will be gone. What will people say? I was so insecure about that Yeah, yeah. yeah. and just, you know, like a couple weeks of, uh, you know, some, uh, whiskey and THC sessions and just like really kind of deep diving into like my own psyche and thinking about and talking to people I trust that, you know, I was able to, to get away from that. Do you have any of that? We're like, I just also kind of feel like if I didn't have the fitness thing, people, it, my credibility is gone. Um, not necessarily because I, I mean, I feel like I have built the credibility and I am able to say, whatever the numbers of how many people have gone through it, what was the retention rate, et cetera. Like I have the data now to share. Now, can somebody actually go see that? No, um, but they would just have to get inside the program now to see anything anyway. So it's sure. really the same. It's, it's no different. I So um, I, I believe that too, but then there's always, like the number one thing I get hit with, it, like it's uh, someone who doesn't know Annie Miller today. And let's say Annie right. Miller phases out the fitness and goes all in the business. And then like, oh, what the fuck? Just like you said earlier, what fitness sure, business sure. have you done? I'm like, oh, I used to do a thing. And the longer <laughs> yeah. that goes, so like, it's like, oh, I had, for a decade, I had a very successful yes. gym. And then, yes. but it, for a decade, then it's going to be 2030. And I'm going to be like, oh, back 10 years ago, I had a really successful gym. So it's right. like, now the one thing I'll say though, I believe I'm a better, I'm better at business uh, and pro I like, I like problem solver. Problem solving is kind of mm -hmm. my, my mm -hmm. genre. Um, because I just work with 40 fucking gyms every month. I get 40 problems. If I had my right. gym, I would just have like my normal problem, whatever. I think I'm actually yeah. way better at what I do because I now I can travel and go and see the problems firsthand and and then work with the clients. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think you, uh, I think, and it's also transcending. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's a great um, Cat Williams Right. Like he's if you, uh, the comedian, he's like, yeah. if you're still fucking What's with he people, yeah, he's got this line. It's like, if you're still fucking your buddies and the, your, your posse, they're still selling weed, you know, 10 years from now, they're not moved up to cocaine, drop them, right. get fucking rid of them. <laughs> right. You need people who are constantly pushing and moving yeah. up. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's something to that. I think like seeing somebody transcend into a different genre beyond where yeah. you where, where you're at. Um, where do you see all that going for you? Like, talk to me about the business coaching side. How do you structure yours? I'm curious. I am much more a fan of, I like creating things. I like creating courses. I like breaking down concepts and making them digestible. It's what I have found that I am best at over the years versus like working one-on-one. -on -one. 
working one-on-one -on -one is fun, um, but I will discontinue all one-on-one -on -one services in August, 2023, when I'm up with my current clients, because I have just seen my courses and leading people through courses is my bread and butter. So that is what I am going all in on from the business perspective. Uh, Lower operational now. drag. 100%. Yeah. yeah. I am all about join the course, do what I say in the course. Uh, they get access to me in like various groups and things like that, but it's not one-on-one, -on -one, it's not live calls. Um, and that's something that kind of was always created one because that's just what, that's how I like to consume. So I prefer courses to one-on-one. -on -one. I like to do things on my own time. I don't wanna have to be on a live call. Uh, and a large part of that is because when I was developing the business side of my business, we were traveling full time. So I'm not fucking with time zones and, sure. yeah. you know, it just didn't work. That business model wasn't going to work for me. Yeah. So I only started one-on-one -on -one business coaching because there was always a demand uh, in 2020 when we were stuck here and couldn't go anywhere. I was like, fine, I'll start coaching people one-on-one -on -one if they want it. Sure. That's so interesting. And yeah. whenever I talk to colleagues on this, because I'm the... I have micro gym university. I, I literally created that as, um, as my down sell. Cause again, when you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, you have a cap, right? It's just like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a job. Yeah. It's not a business. Yeah. And, um, but MGU could then be like, Hey, listen. And also it's just like, you don't know fucking your basic finances from your asshole. Just like, just enroll in this. And then yeah. we can get, let, let, we can work together in a little bit. Um, yeah. once we get that business acumen up, and I like, I like creating court because I enjoy content. Like the other thing too, you've had to probably do, you, did you have like camera, media, did you have all that experience prior to this or did you YouTube it and learn? All YouTube, YouTube yeah. university 100%. for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's like my kid, my that's why she's always like, what, what do you think we're going to do with college? I'm like, fucking college, YouTube, motherfucker, YouTube. Yeah. That's like, how we feel. <laughs> yeah. Let's fucking put this yeah. kid on YouTube. Um, yeah. I, but I, I guess that's been always the thing is like, I guess I like the idea of, I, I just like the pro I like, I like the problem and I like the project house was one of my favorite shows. Oh, same. Like just the level of dickheadedness, but like <laughs> still kind of a good guy you always rooted for him. Oh, I was like, for sure. Yeah. I can get down with that. Like between Ari gold from entourage and yes. fucking house. Like Hope that's love entourage. That's what I wanted. That's that was like right. my, Oh my God. That's what I want to be as a leader. Like that's me that's right really there. Funny. Um, but I, I like, I, you know, uh, get a, get it. Someone books it in a call and I kind of look at the problem and I'm like, ah, it's I've done it a thousand times. I'm not that interested in it. I'll do this call, help them out, pushing mm -hmm. them. G but that problem. Oh, that's fun. I haven't done that problem yet. Let's fuck with that. Like, I don't even know if I can fix that problem, but let's, I think mm -hmm. I can't like, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. I've just, I've, that's the only thing I've found that I've still, I love more than anything is, is that individual problem solving piece and yeah. not and like, like, so do you have like a template? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't have anything to hand you. I literally don't have a yeah. single system to give you. We yeah. will co-create everything you're going to create it. I'm going to engineer it. You're going to execute on it and it. I'll ensure it's, you know, it doesn't suck and it's business savvy and it's going to work. Um, but yeah, that's, I don't know. That's, I think, you know, for everyone who does like what we do, it's just kind of, you know, how, what, what form of coaching do you prefer? The yeah. nice about your courses is that, you know, they, you know, they live forever. And how often do you find you have to refresh? Uh, full refresh, probably every two to three years. Um, is what I've done so far. Little refreshes here and there, I'll just do on my own. Um, but like full on, like redoing every video, updating workbooks, whatever, every yeah. two to three years. You, uh, your site is great. And you know what? A yeah. lot of people like when they go and they, they jump on a, uh, like, what should I get? Like Wix? I'm like, ah, fuck it. Go to show it. Like yeah. <laughs> go get, there's better looking versions that your website's great. I love it. Thank you. Um, when someone comes to you for the business coaching side, like what is your, like, what is your top end of the funnel look like? What is that? Is that like, cause if you're not looking to do the one-on-ones anymore, yeah. is it, where do they go first? So the, I have a free thing. It's called the ICA creator. I don't plan it. Figure out who the fuck you're talking to. So I am huge. I say that I sell clarity versus like a revenue point sure. of any kind. I sell clarity. Whenever anybody goes through any of my freebies, I have a $27 know your niche content guide. Whenever they go through anything at any level of my coaching, it's always like, oh my gosh, I feel so clear on 
who I'm talking to now, what I need to create for them now, what my offer should be like, that is the point. That is what I sell. So that's, uh, that's what people are getting, whether they download something for free or whether they purchase something along know your niche guide, Instagram 101, Fitzboro foundations, it's clarity on the business side. That's what they're going to get, which allows them to actually take momentum and move forward versus spinning their wheels over and over again. Do you mind talking uh, business numbers? Uh, go, hopefully I have whatever you're, <laughs> whatever you're asking about. <laughs> whatever yeah. it is. Ballpark you're free it. to ask. Yeah, yeah, ballpark it. I just like, so, you know, again, you started this uh, and then three years later is when you kind of doubled down on it and you went all in on it, right? You know, you guys mm -hmm. did the travel the world thing. So in that period of time, because everyone I think thinks like the online, it, it's like this, it's this blue ocean and I'm just going to crush it. Like it, it is a time constructive thing. I think it's going to take you a minimum of a year to find your voice. A Ooh, yeah, minimum, yeah. you know, I think between one Agreed. and three years for you to establish yourself as like a micro, I consider anything under a hundred K and followership on any, whatever platform, like a micro mm -hmm. influencer, which I believe is where the most amount of money is. The yeah. most amount of money for your own products and services, the second you cap six figures on there, you're now essentially a little bit more of a billboard. You could yeah. go be this, you could go direct to consumer and sell your stuff. You're going to get very tempted to sling a few things for some easy money. Mm -hmm. And I just think that is a, a quick um, snowball effect as far as that goes. Well, so, okay. Yeah. Numbers wise, uh, like what ha what is give someone like kind of the growth of your company and like just let's do total annual revenue or something close to that or monthly or whatever number you want to throw at just to show them what that climb looks like for you yes roughly so roughly uh in my first year of like just the online side of my business in 2015 i made four thousand dollars <laughs> Remember, I was training in person. And you were probably um, pumped as fuck about that too, though. I was so fucking proud of myself, <laughs> Sue. I was so fucking proud of myself because that $4,000 was like, there's something here. Yeah. I can do this, right? Like, I, we were driving to Bend. We drive there every year for Christmas. And I remember doing my numbers in the car. And I was like, I generated $4,000. Like, I was so fucking proud of myself. Next year, on the online side, made 15 grand. Year after that, I want to say was 60, very slow. Like people who think that it's quick, I'm like, but granted, I was not all in. So the sooner you go all in on anything, the sooner you're probably going to have results from it. I do think that I'm not, I'm not uh, arguing that. And then in 2018, made six figures, 2019, multi six figures, fitness side. I really like to differentiate that because that was something else that was important to me. Uh, when I started coaching business, I was like, I'm never going to use my business numbers to sell what you can do in fitness because I don't think it's the same, mm -hmm. at least for most people. Like sure. the price points that you're working with, the buy-in is different. Um, people are way more willing to invest in their business with less resistance than they are in fitness oftentimes. Um, and then now we're, you know, over, over half a million going for seven figures. I so, love it, man. I yeah. love it. And yeah. Uh, have you ever read the book or heard about Company of One? Yes. Okay. Have it. Haven't read it. <laughs> okay. Incredible. So, but that was the book that changed. Uh, I still had the gym at that point. And we were still, I was, I think that was like maybe a year before we decided to do the licensing route. And then obviously you switched everything up on the real estate play, but uh, that book changed everything for me. That's when I realized, because like if you, I, I, any, uh, you get hit by a bus tonight, uh, how long to the business just runs the zero in revenue generation? Oh, uh, more context. Is my assistant still <laughs> able to work for it? Yeah, I mean, she's still there, um, you know, but does she have access to the to the EIN and the bank account? Like, I don't know how much like right, of a right, succession right. plan you have with her, but. Right. You get hit Gosh, by a bus. I don't know. When does it run to zero? Because, I mean, she can only keep reposting old things of you. She mm -hmm. might be able to do some deep fakes of you um, or something, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it would be pretty quick. Yeah. As far and, as is content creation, I mean, everything lives evergreen, but as far as generating leads. Sure. Yeah. Right? And that's where I think uh, I like this idea of like, I wanted a, a company of one mentality. I, wa I didn't want it to become a business. The gym was that, and it, it's great. You know, it, mm -hmm. it you know, you walk mm -hmm. away and if you can get it to that point and it's, it thrive, you come back after like, you know, taking a, a three week vacation, like, oh fuck, we're making more money. You fired yeah, that guy yeah. that I didn't like anyway. Good job. This place is right. great. But there's stress with that. 
Mm -hmm. employees, like people that are dependent on you and ups and there's just, you know, it is. And I love this idea. If I just take this laptop and close it, minus my fucking kid who I have to stay in Charlotte, right. North Carolina now, because she kind of matters, I guess. And it would destroy her or irreparably damage her if I left. Um, <laughs> but now I'm stuck here uh, for the time, at least until she's 18. But yeah. I just love that idea of us. I, I up and fucking yeah. bounce and do yeah. my thing. And I, I could stop this at any time. I don't owe anyone fucking anything. I started a business and I just decided I wanted to pivot and change. I can't. I got a lot of people I'm fucking up their lives. Like yeah, yeah. a lot of them kind of scenario. How, how do you think of yourself of having a business versus a job versus like career or whatever you want to call it? So I don't know what you want to categorize it as. My goal was always to get to a point. Well, not always, but it evolved over the years through clarity to, I want to be the person that creates stuff. And then I want a person who implements it. That's what I want. In the business, I want to create stuff. I want to create courses. I want to create content. Um, I want to be the visionary of the overarching theme of how people go from that content to then obviously into my offers. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I don't want to manage clients. And so that is what my assistant, my right-hand woman does. She's been with me since 2019. Uh, and I don't want more employees. My goal was always like, how big can I get by myself? That has always been my goal and it has not changed over the years. So I've hired contractors and things like that to help build things out uh, for one-off jobs and stuff. But as far as like people I have to be in contact with, I am really about my business allowing me to live my life. And I don't want to have z literally like a negative desire to manage people yeah. on the client side or on the employee side. I want to get as big and efficient as I can nearly by myself with my assistant. That's it. Your uh, your assistant. Call that what is you this, want. I, I love it. I would call again. I'd, <laughs> so I I would call that a company of one. A company of one's not a company of one person. It's it's essentially you're running this thing as lean as possible, yes. so that if you ever decided to pivot and change on it, I mean you have the luxury to do so. You have the luxury yeah. to turn it off. Paul Jarvis, yeah. I actually got to do his last interview because he completely pivoted from writing oh. in company one, and he was going into this tech product he created, and I got wow. to do his very last. Uh, interview and which I was so excited about, but yeah, uh, where'd you find your assistant? This a, a VA or is this someone client. local? She was where? a client. Okay, cool, very yeah. cool. So she was a fitness client of mine who I knew companies that she had worked for, um, and I knew that she, you know, had a little side hustle of her own as far as like blogging and stuff goes. So she just had a kind of jack of all trades thing about her, and I was like, "Hi, I'm at my ceiling. I need some help." Would you like to work for me? And she said yes, and the rest is history. So, and um, was that your first? That that's your first and only like legit hire, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just uh, for WTF, we just did. Uh, I hired a creative director, and that was someone. So I got like editing teams in the Philippines, right? Through video husky yeah. and services like that, and but okay. like managing that shit and the. You know, just managing the creative side of it and like uploading all the footage and making sure the editors don't fuck shit up and it looks a certain way we want and all that stuff. That, that's that's a full time gig. And they're in the Philippines, which makes the cost low. But now you're they're working from 6 p.m. to 6, you know, or 4 a.m. or whatever the, the yeah, shift yeah. is. So yep. uh, that's that's shitty when you want to communicate as so far as that goes. But that was that was uh, just this past year. Um, and that was uh, the first time I you know brought anyone in on that front. And I'm so for less than six grand a month uh, for that individual, it's a life changing fucking gig for like ha partner for me to have. Yeah. Someone in this thing who's part admin, mainly a creative director, handles some admin shit, but it's uh, super fucking helpful. Uh, yeah. Finding people, though, is tough. Did you try the VA route that. for a while? So that's, I mean, my assistant is a, a VA, just Got it. stateside. Yeah. Got it. But did you go yeah. to like, did you try any VA firms no. like prior or anything like that? Or that like was Upwork something, or? no, I mean, I, I hired my first uh, lawyer to draft up things that I needed for business via Upwork. Yep. Um, but other than that, I never used Upwork. I do tell people to use it because it's super easy to mm. use if you need something quick for a one-off job. I think it's great. Um, but I am in the same boat as far as business goes in needing to, especially with, I have a five month old, four month old, uh, almost five months, needing to free up more space to where like, I'm literally only creating the stuff and someone else is editing and all of that, because I still do very self-taught over here. So I can <laughs> edit all the things, create all the things. Uh, and it's a 
it's a time in my business where it's like, I can do it. So can somebody else, somebody sure. else needs to be doing it. So that's i I've debated, you know, what is my budget of video content media leader of some kind that takes that over for yeah. me. We'll see. But would that be the next thing you would hire is something in that realm. I'm debating. Um, currently I'm talking with a PR agency yep. to basically this, get me get, because I am, if you want to call me a company of one, the, the goal is get me in front of as many people, as many of the right people as possible without paid advertising. So organically, but I'm paying someone to get me organically in front of more people or to go the route of just uh, becoming more efficient in and maybe expanding my video content onto YouTube because it's not there. Um, and I do think that I could smash on YouTube, especially as a female strength coach. Um, I don't see a lot of high value happening in that realm. So. Do you, are you, you're, your distribution channels from content, is it diversified? Is it mainly like if Instagram went down today or just deleted your account because they thought you fucked, did something nasty? Where, like, where's the, the, the diversification? Or would that really fuck you up? Um, that would fuck me up as far as I have a healthy email list. That email list has been built from people. So when somebody checks out on my uh, website, I can see where they found me, how long they followed me for. I think you even gave us those questions in the group, right? Yeah. So I ask everybody where you found me originally, how long you've been in my audience for, where did you sign up from? And it's literally always Instagram, however long they've been with me, email. Like that is what happens. They find me, but they sign up from email. Yep. Sales are coming from email as far as where I would then get those email subscribers. That would be a little bit of a stomach in the butthole situation. Yeah. I, uh, what it was 20 end of 2020. Um, it was, I think it was around the election period or something. I forget what it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then YouTube ripped my entire, it was 900 plus videos and it wasn't, Shut I, up. Oh yeah. No, I had 900 plus videos up there that I've been uploading since 2015. Uh, subscriber count was probably under 4,000 subs, but the, but the monthly views uh -huh. were just well above. I never, they never even turned on monetization. Like it was just, yeah. This is where I put all my shit because it was all long form. I did, I committed yeah, to a yeah. year of vlogging and all this shit and uh, all gone. And you get an appeal, but it's just a robot. Appeal get denied. For sure, no, yeah. no, granted, I've got like fucking, I've got terabytes and terabytes of hard drives with everything backed up. Mm -hmm. So I had to hire someone to just go ahead and just re-upload every, and we didn't even get every single video uploaded. We got the majority of them. But that's the day I went to Substack and started the newsletter because I never really fucked it. Like, I was like, I have to diversify the platform. You know, I need yeah. at least, if I get booted, I just need to be able to reach out to everyone and be like, yo, here's where I'm at, right? Yes. Just so you know. Yes. It's, yeah. and it's super scary. Yeah, which I do feel I have that with email. I mean, I, I love email marketing. Um, I love writing. So in addition to video, like writing is actually my preferred way of communication, messaging, selling. That's why I love copywriting for sales pages and things like that. I've never done a sales call. Um, I much prefer writing. So email marketing is, is my shit. I enjoy it. But again, uh, acquiring new leads would be like, where am I going to do that now? From a course so. creator perspective, obviously e-learning has gotten super popular. Um, use Thinkific too, right? Jeez. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what, what, so I, when I started MGU, I created, I spent, lock me, I spent like nine, 10 months on it and i did it as a very expensive pip it was sixty five hundred dollars for oh, yeah. a year enrollment um okay. and it was great I, I loved it it worked it was great um but the thing it was just like that one big hit and then i and then i chilled for a while right because i you okay. know spent nine ten months doing it a bunch of money's yeah. coming in you know it was heavy for the first three months and then it kind of trickled and then it's like okay fuck, like i got to i'm gonna have to come up with the next the ascension of this thing right yeah then I switched over and I went to uh, a lower $50 recurring a month. And what I created in MGU became like a one-on-one. And then, cause I like shooting and I've got the full video podcast studio here. I just fucking, you know, just uploading videos every single month, new shit. Yeah. Um, and I went to that lower uh, price point volume-based play. What have you played with as far as, um, as far as pricey models? Are you going volume? Are you going quality? What does that look like? Um, so Fitzroy Foundation, which is my business course, is a six-week course. It's nineteen ninety-seven, so two thousand bucks. 
um, very in market, in the middle of the market expected. Uh, and I do think that it is, I mean, people say it's far more valuable than that. Uh, and that is my, my goal. Now I have debated lower, I find with low investment comes low adherence and a lot of fucking problems. So sure. <laughs> that is what I am weary of uh, in offering lower priced things is the headaches and the type of consumer, not every consumer, but the type of consumer that tends to come with that uh, versus higher ticket things. Sure. So. And that's, I, I think where mine came from, it was like, I, uh, when I created MGU, the first version, it was like this, then this, then this, just like most courses are, right? There's a mm -hmm. chronological order. Yeah. And then I'm like, I fucking, I like Netflix. I like to just like, what do I fucking feel? I want to watch this. I want to watch that. I like YouTube. So I was yeah, like, you want a library. Yeah. yeah I'm just going to create that. I'm just going to create this and just keep dropping content that's relative and clickbaity and like just good solid shit. And just, you know, for a business owner uh, on an operating expense standpoint, $50 a month to them is like $9.99 to a regular oh, consumer yeah. with the Netflix. It's, it's worth it. If one good video a month pops in there that they learn something from kind, kind of scenario. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just inter I'm always really interested with anyone else doing e-learning and stuff online is like, like what kind of what kind of model they've gone after from a revenue standpoint. Well, yeah, the low, I mean, I have business clients who have monthly memberships that are in that $37-ish yeah. range. There's a monthly training and they get like some kind of worksheet with it. And you just sometimes it applies to you, sometimes it doesn't, but 37 bucks is whatever. So and that's totally works for them and it's fine. Yeah. Just not not something that I have delved into or desire to so which could change yeah do you see um so with your business coaching is essentially teaching online fitness professionals how to start and grow the business yeah will you ever make the leap to then teaching those successful online fitness professionals how to start coaching other fitness do, coaching what you coach now essentially that thing like i'm now going to teach you how to create an online business coaching solution that is not something i desire to do right now um something that is on the the docket for 2024 2025 whenever i probably plan on having another child quicker than than not so we'll see as far as timeline and creating this um my dms are decently full cool with coaches who have either gone through my fits or foundations course, or they have, you know, done some kind of foundational work in their business. Maybe they're generating five to seven K they're looking to hit that six figures, but also they're at their ceiling with one-on-one -on -one clients. So maybe they are at the 10 K and they're like, crap, I feel like I'm at the beginning of business again, where now I have all these options. Like the funnel opens back up. What do I hire coaches? Do I create a membership? Do I like, what do I do now? Um, there is a very, very big gap in the fitness industry for that person. If they don't want to join a mastermind with other types of businesses that are not in the fitness field. So it's not that nothing exists for them, but there is a definite gap, at least in my community of people who need that next step. So I hate masterminds. Um, not a fan. Don't want to run one. Again, I really love courses. So I'm like, is there a course on how to scale once your one-on-one -on -one roster is full? And if there's not, I will probably create it because when I see a gap, I just want to fill it with things. Absolutely. Yeah. We, um, I talked earlier about the micro-influencer and for everyone doing the math at home. So Annie was talking about the trajectory of revenue that her online business and just, I mean, you guys obviously understand we have very, very nice profit margins coming from you know yep. having brick and mortar having uh, real estate holdings and then having online, I'd take online majority oh, of the time, yes. you know, it just, it's very nice. Um, but out of 37, 38,000 followers, mm -hmm. you're able to generate around half a million dollars marching up towards 700. That's, yes. you know, this essentially, if you can, you're monetizing each follower to the tune of $13 a piece, if you broke it down per purse, like, will you talk to everyone about I think people are concerned when they start this path. And I guarantee you get this. Like I only have 3,000 followers. Like, you know what the great thing about 3,000 followers is? They all know you. Yeah, intimately. they're listening. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're significantly listening. Like you've probably actually physically they're touched. They're engaged. You've literally probably physically touched most of them 
it, like physically because yeah. they went to school with you, friends, neighbors, whatever, or you're two degrees of separation away for the most part. And yeah. then, you know, as you grow, what do you tell people as far as like the growth that like, are you ever mindful? You're like, honestly, like if I got to a hundred thousand, like, I think that would, I don't think I'd be as effective. Like, I think my ability to monetize my audience would significantly decrease at that point. Or how do you think of growth of audience and what's necessary to make good revenue? Um, one thing, context is important. So I've been growing my audience for almost 10 years on Instagram. There's a lot of dead accounts in that 37,000. So I don't consider myself having 37,000. I consider myself having like 10,000 as far as like engagement goes. Um, so I think context is important. I was just talking to a colleague that has like 280,000 and she's like, mm, I have like 35,000. Like that's really what I'm working with here. So I think context and how long you've been on the platform matters uh, versus somebody who has, you know, started this year and built to 5,000 followers. Those are like 5,000 engaged followers. That's a huge freaking deal. Um, and I have business clients. None of my business clients have large audiences. Uh, all of them, some of them, okay, some of them have like 18,000. Most of them are under 3,000 and all of them are making over six figures. One of them it has under, I think she has 500 followers and she's making uh, six figures. And she had an account with 1,700, but she was like, I'm going to start a new account. And with that new account is where she has established because everyone is actually seeing your content, your percentage of people who are actually seeing and engaging with your content when you have a smaller audience is so much bigger than when you have a large audience. I can't stress it enough. That's it's a just business case study. Deceiving. That 500, 500 followers and doing something like what a killer, yeah. killer. Do you have a podcast? And she's in Germany. <laughs> like not even, you know, she's not even stateside as far as like, whatever access to things uh, she has, she can see less insights in Germany because of Europe and what they're allowed to see as far as privacy goes too. So just interesting. Do you have a podcast? Yeah. Do you ever interview your clients like this on the business side? No, 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 no. it would be uh, valuable. It would like, I, I would like, I was going to say like, when you interview her, let me know. I'd love to hear that because yeah. that's such a unique case study. That's, yeah. um, you know, it's like when I see a gym do 600,000 a year in 1400 square feet at, with group fit, I'm just like, bro, like just you're yeah. a unicorn. You're a fucking unicorn. Yeah. Where, uh, let me, so you got the kid number two, yeah. talk to me about that. So, um, people think like, oh, you're lucky you have an online business. You don't have to go to the gym anymore and roll up the bay doors and do, you don't have to be somewhere mm -hmm. uh, correct, but I I bet at times you kind of wish you could take your whole little studio and set up and fucking go to a WeWork where n no one could yell mommy or honey and leave you the fuck alone. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, the one I have always been very like, I want to work the least amount that I possibly can. Um, not out of laziness, out of efficiency. Like sure. I want to make oh, yeah. a certain amount of money and why would I want to work more than I need to work in order to do that? <laughs> Um, but yes, since having a child, I can absolutely see, uh, colleagues of mine who literally built a business to where they're at home all the time, choose to leave the house <laughs> to go to an office <laughs> to work. It's like the nine to five has now you're back in that, but obviously with a completely different, uh, perspective, different setup, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. Boundaries are huge. So I literally two car garage like seven six hundred seven hundred square whatever it is and i just turned yeah. it all into studio and all that and then uh my girl bought this incredibly this awesome on-air sign outside that i flick on and my kid she's six and everyone just knows like this is not like, don't, don't even consider this a part of this house this is yes. not a part of this house i yes. know you can access it but literally yeah. pretend like it's not a part of this house that yeah. signs on and you come in here I will literally like I get a squirt bottle, just, just get the fuck out. Like yes. it's, it's just one of those things. Cause especially as a creative, if you're in the zone and you're like, you oh. know how you're just pumping out slides, you're like I'm fucking like fuck chat GPT. I'm the shit. I'm cracking yeah. out slides. Like it's my job. And then, you know, so, something interrupts you. And then you're like, Oh, it's gone. It's fucking gone for today. I had all that magic and now it's a bye bye Uninterrupted work. will absolutely a uh, little man is now sleeping like, 11 hours straight through the night. So I am now transitioning to where I think I will probably be like a 5 a.m. wake her upper 
to work yeah. uninterrupted for two or three hours. And then like, if the rest of my day goes to shit, let it, I will just sit in the shit and let it happen because I have done what I need to do. That's my hack. It's four. I get up at yeah. four 30. I've got no one fucks with me until 9am. Yeah. It just, I, you know, it's like, I get a whole fucking extra day of work in. Um, yeah. I love it. I love it. Any, um, currently right now. So like on the, on the fitness and business side, what is it you're working on? What is it like? What project I, I get excited. If I get excited about a course idea, like, uh, mm -hmm. we've got this one, the gym real estate company, we got this course going on. I'm, I'm buying an SBA 504 loans and all this shit. I get excited about something. I just fucking dive into it. Are okay. you, do you pre-plan your courses out ahead of time or do you just go off the top? Like what's relevant? What's the question I'm getting asked? That kind of thing. Um, Kind of both. So minor, I would say it's a long-term thing. So I wait until I have seen consistently a gap, a need, whatever, uh, which was the programming side of things. I mean, I thought of pure programming, not the name, but the concept of a programming course back in 2018 when we were traveling. We were on a freaking road trip in Portugal and I was like, I know this is a need. I don't have the capacity. Maybe I'll have the capacity eventually. And three years later, actually had the time and capacity to create it. Um, and so it's, I definitely am, if, if I have something, it's going to happen. I do not do well with unfinished projects or un, uh, things not coming to fruition if I have an idea. So similar to this, uh, that middle tier business for coaches, like I know it's such a need. I'm not going to create it when I have a newborn. So that's maybe 24, 25. Got it. Yeah. And pure, I was looking at I was looking at the pure programming page on your website here. Oh, yeah. um, the one thing I love is that you have all these your these approved CEUs for oh, all the yeah. different sorts. How what is that process like? Okay, that was literally so important to me. Like that was uh, my motive, I guess, for creating pure programming was that I was a certified strength and conditioning coach, and the continuing education that was required was shit and I had to spend my money on it and other things that I actually wanted to take from people yeah. that I knew I wasn't going to get CEUs for. So I had to choose what I'm spending my money on. So my goal was to create something that you actually want to spend money on and you get maximum CEUs because it's a 13 freaking week course yeah. packed with information. So it's max CEUs from all of these uh, organizations, which was like a non-negotiable for me. It needed to be approved for CEUs if I was going to ask people to pay me for it. Yeah. But like when you go to prove, when you go through that process, cause I mean, you have ISSA in here, NSCA, are you a member of all these? And that's what like, it helps nope. you kind of have the question. Okay. So like no. AFA, NSA, SM, did you have to, is there like just an application form for yeah. these? You have to, yeah, payment and application. So obviously there's a fee with it. Um, and you have to, you know, pay that fee recurring in order to continue to have it be approved, but it's just, they have to get access to the course. They have to see the back end. They have to see all the quiz questions, uh, curriculum, video time, word count, page count, all the all the logistics of the course, and then they approve it. So I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Annie, this was dope. I appreciate you uh, taking the time out uh, and just you know coming on to, to shoot the shit. I love when I see someone else uh, in the online space uh, doing well. You. Um, I, again, I, the thing I just love your stuff's always curated. I mean, like even your color Thank palette, you. it's on the back of your fucking wall behind you. Like, yeah. li, like <laughs> you're very thoughtful on it. Uh, let me ask you this. I bet you, my guess is your house, the interior design of your house. It's fucking dope. Like my guess, it's, like, are you good at interior design? I feel like you are. Uh, yeah. So when I was deciding on what to go to school for, it was, uh, actually fashion design, cosmetology or fitness. So just aesthetics in general, I enjoy it. It matters to me. If I buy something from you and it looks like shit, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to look at it. It's a me thing. Like the value is likely there. Yeah. Um, but to me, it's a lack of give a shit. And sure. so I just, when somebody, I could have plain text for all of my workbooks, but when somebody opens my PDF and it's beautiful and it's enjoyable to go through, they're like, oh wow, she gives a shit. Like she went above and beyond, or that's the hope that the person has. Like it just elevates that experience in my opinion. Nobody loves to, or nobody hates to look at pretty things. I, uh, I wish I had more of an interior design wall or like, like <laughs> a skill, like literally my idea of interior design, I commissioned an artist to create a bottle of Jameson traveling That's, down I my was wondering wall. what that was and you're like is that piss behind him and then into a glass a rocks glass nice. like 
that's it, it, and I remember girlfriend first time she came over to my house she's like how old are you are you in still fucking college what is with it I don't know that's what I thought looked good I I'm an idiot um but it's authentic uh, you know it it's is. authentic <laughs> it is it is <laughs> Any, if anyone would love to reach out, just uh, they've got questions they'd like to learn more, whatever it may be, what's the best way they can get in contact with you? Um, either Instagram at AnnieMiller.co or hello at AnnieMiller.co is my email. AnnieMiller.co is my website. It's all AnnieMiller.co. Awesome. All right, kids. I'll yeah. throw that shit in the show notes. Annie, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely.